Well, good afternoon, good morning, or good evening, depending upon where you are in the world. And welcome to today's Security Boulevard webinar. I'm Charlene O'Hanlon, moderator for today's event, and I welcome you. We have a great webinar on tap. I'm so excited about this one. This is really, really gonna be an interesting one. But before we get started, we do have a few housekeeping items we need to go over. First of all, today's event is being recorded. So if you miss any or all of the event, you will have the opportunity to access it later on. Following today's webinar, we will be sending out an email that contains a link to access the webinar on demand. And we are taking questions from the audience. So if at any time during today's presentation, you have a question for either of our speakers, please don't wait, don't hesitate. Just use the question and answer tab on your interface there and submit your questions. And we'll try to get to as many as we can near the end of today's webinar. We also have a very interactive chat feature, and we encourage you to chat us your questions, comments, suggestions, whatever you want to share with us. We'll be more than happy to take it, and we might even chat you back. And then also at the end of today's webinar, we are going to be doing a drawing for four $25 Amazon gift cards. So please stick around. Hopefully you'll be one of our four lucky winners. All right. I think I covered everything. With that, let's go ahead and kick off kick today's, today's webinar, webinar, which is embarking on digital transformation with the right security approach. The speakers today, our speakers today are Eric Larson, who is a regional director and lead cloud practitioner at Crosslake, and Brian Rogers, who is a solutions engineer, global channels and alliances at White Source. Gentlemen, thank you so much for joining me today. I really do appreciate it. Great to see you both. Uh, Eric, I know you're going to be kicking off the conversation, so I'm going to turn things over to you. I will put myself on mute, take myself off camera, let you get right to it. All right. Thanks so much, Charlene. Appreciate that. And uh, hello, everyone. Welcome. Uh, Brian and I are excited about our conversation today. And so this is kind of our general working agenda. We'll obviously introduce ourselves, um, kind of walk through some themes from the last 18 months, get you uh, some really good content here about open source um, and then obviously kind of wrap it up uh, with key takeaways. As Charlene mentioned, if you guys do have questions along the way, feel free to throw them in the chat. We've got a Q&A section at the end, but um, if your question is something we can weave into uh, what we're working through here, we'd love to, love to interact with you that way. Um, so uh, Brian, I'll let you say hi to the folks and then um, we'll, we'll get underway here. Hey, thanks, Eric. Um, hey, everybody. Thank you for having me. My name is Brian Rogers. Um, I am a solutions engineer for uh, White Source, specifically on our global channels and alliances, and I'd be happy to be here. Awesome. And uh, again, Eric Larson, uh, my, my background is actually as a software developer. Did, did that for about 20 plus years. Um, sort of worn almost every uh, IT hat on the engineering side, except for QA formally. Uh, worked Worked a lot of uh, software development projects, got pretty interested in the DevOps conversation, done a lot of cloud work. Um, and, and these days kind of find myself doing a bunch of interesting projects, including some interim CTO work. And so this, this next slide here, I think really is gonna set the context um, for what we're diving into here. And so as I think back over kind of what I've seen the last 18, 12 to 18 months, Obviously, we're, uh, we're recording this in the middle of 2021, and so there's been some pretty interesting news events um, that have been happening uh, in the last 18 months. Kind of starting here on the, on the bottom left, um, one major theme is cost. And so cost optimization almost seemed to drive every conversation um, back in 2020. We're sort of coming out of that a little bit now that we're halfway through 2021, and I'm seeing a lot more um, question around automation. So now that we've kind of got the cost thing under wraps, this theme of automation, you know, so some things like what are we optimizing? What can we automate? Um, how do we you know, create this observability, you know, making our metrics and measures visual, visual and also actionable. And, and we're actually gonna talk about that today. Brian's got some really good um, really good examples here for us to dive into. And, and so really we're fitting that within this overall context of this theme here, this digital modernization and transformation. And so that's those are some buzzwords I'm sure um, that, that we're familiar with over the last, you know, longer than 18 months, maybe the last two to five years. We've really been talking about overall this transforming, what can technology do to transform not just the engineering department, but the overall organization as well. And then more specifically inside of IT perhaps is what things do we need to modernize? What, 
what changes do we need to make, you know, for our, our process and, you know, maybe our tool chain, um, some of the technologies that we're using. And then interestingly, you know, how does that impact, you know, the wider organization as well? How does that change our teams? Um, what does that do? You know, again, what are these ripple effects? And so it, it's kind of with that lens right there and when, with that zooming in that the, the rest of our content here, we really want to dive into, you know, some more specific things specifically related to the tool chain. So, with that, let's um, let's kind of jump in. So, uh, th thanks for the introduction, Eric. Um, so, just to take one of your buzzwords. Uh, so, when we're thinking about the digital modernization and transformation that's happening right now, <clears throat> um, a lot of that and a lot of the content we've prepared today boils down to the actual security around the application itself. Uh, and the reason being is because there's so many attack vectors, which we'll get to in a minute here. But uh, what we're talking about when we talked about AppSec is really just the protection of our applications as a whole from external hacks, uh, external attacks, excuse me, uh, any sort of privilege abuse um, and or data theft. All right, so we'll move on to our next slide here. So <clears throat> when we think about why we're open to attacks on the application level uh, comparatively to, to other areas, say of your system, of your uh, endpoints, uh, it's because the application is basically a bridge between the end user and the, uh, and the developer, the development teams, the engineering teams. So we think about the DevSecOps transformation, um, the application is really that bridge and really it is that experience at the end of the day uh, as a user. Um, you think about any major company right now, these days in a, <laughs> this day and age, they have an application as the endpoint. Uh, so we really are looking at securing, um, in many areas, uh, open source specifically, which we'll get to in a little bit. Um, <clears throat> but taking a step back, uh, on the topic of application security as a whole, looking at other areas, um, especially to the uh, point of expenditure that Eric mentioned previously, um, we look at the gaps in spending uh, versus you know, where most of the money is being allocated to right now. So level of annual spending in red, um, as you can see from uh, white source polls, uh, most is being spent right now on network security. Um, <clears throat> however, the level of risk is most uh, exploitable in the application level, as you can see here. Yeah. Uh, I'm sorry, is there a question? No, I don't think so. Your, your audio is coming through fine for me. Um, but, okay. but just to kind of double down on that, I mean, like, it, it's almost like we need to think about the code that we're writing as, as a liability, you know, um, and, and defend against it. You know, the networks uh, are fluctuating, right? But we've spent a, <laughs> spent a ton of money, right, um, on network, you know, perimeter defense, et cetera, which is great. That's a good first line of defense. But con continuing to fence in, that code that we write, that code that I wrote, you know, 20 some odd years ago, some of it's still in production today, right? And that's, uh, it's al that's almost a liability. Like more code is not necessarily always best. <laughs> more code is more things that, you know, we need to, to defend against. Exactly. <laughs> and as you can see, the, the application uh, vector specifically, it also touches these other vectors. So your networks, your endpoints, your data, your servers, uh, all communicate with your application. So to that point, you know, making more areas of security, more areas of expenditure. Um, but the point being that the application should be uh, one of, if not the center point of your security posture as a whole. So to take that a step further, um, enterprise applications specifically. So back to the point of that end app, the end user uh, interacting with an application. Um, if you're talking about an enterprise organization, uh, we're talking probably about a few, if not, you know, one to five um, top level enterprise applications. Uh, so. So as there's not being enough expenditure towards application security as a whole, uh, specifically the focus needs to be on those applications with the most exploitability, uh, with that most, with the most threat to be had. So fitting in within the SDLC um, and uh, automation uh, as another big big player here is, is key. Um, it's something that White Source helps uh, not only stand up but secure against uh, within the SDLC. Yeah, I like that, that uh, SS, 
SDLC because you know we need more acronyms these days. But uh, I love the secure SDLC. That it's that shifting everything left, right? You know, as we, you know, we've got to influence our process, not just our tooling. So love love the call out there. Exactly. exactly. That's that's another buzzword you'll hear come up. Uh, probably a few more times in this presentation, but shifting left is, is key. So taking um, that end user and securing as far left in your development life cycle as you can get, um, <clears throat> that's something that White Source uh, helps tremendously with uh, many enterprise customers. So when we take a look a bit further as to why is it difficult to remediate said vulnerabilities. Um, we're looking at remediation now. So we're taking detection, uh, something that White Source uh, does just naturally through our scanning process, uh, taking that out of, not necessarily out of the cards, but putting it aside because we can detect everything, uh, but, but now the, the focus lies on how do we fix it and how do we fix it efficiently. Um, so why do we typically see vulnerabilities um, uh, sit? so to speak, uh, or not get remediated effectively. Um, because the patches, they might be uh, tiresome, they might be manual, they might not work. Uh, the inability to detect vulnerabilities efficiently, so just the lack of tooling in general. Um, the lack of qualified personnel and just the know-how. Um, so there's a lot there's a lot going on in the AppSec space. There's a ton going on in the, in the DevSecOps space right now. So there's a lot of moving pieces and just lacking that knowledge of the AppSec industry, but also um, of how the tools within the AppSec world function is, uh, has been a big driver. And that's something that we also help, um, help to give as much knowledge or knowledge base as possible, possible. to our customers. Are, are, are you seeing like, are you seeing a big uh, shifts or trends or anything related to kind of overall cloud adoption? I mean, I, I know we're not even at the tipping point, you know, everyone thinks that, you know, everyone's in the cloud, that that's actually not true. You know, we have not even crossed the 50% tipping point, but it, is there, is there an influence of this admittedly smaller percentage, but certainly loud and noisy, right? You know, everything that's going on in cloud, is that kind of influencing prem? And are we getting that back and forth thing yet where both, you know, sides are, are really learning, you know, from each other or kind of where I would are we say going? so. so. Um, I would say, to your point, 100% um, we're seeing that friction right now uh, from the on-premise model that you see that you typically see more in um, in depth a few years back, uh, shifting more towards the cloud base, whether that be a dedicated uh, hosted environment or just a SaaS offering, um, <clears throat> both of which we, we do offer. Uh, but I would say definitely the shift has been more towards the cloud uh, lately because you can achieve all the same security features with say uh, that you can achieve more or less on premise with a dedicated uh, hosted environment. So um, not to mention the, the ease of use and uh, and just the ease of, uh, of, of helping that uh, bridge that knowledge transfer from the white source or um, from your security specialist to the end user. Uh, so all in all, yes, there's been a definitely a uh, shift and a migration to the cloud. And um, <clears throat> with that, as you mentioned, uh, you know, learning off, bouncing ideas off of each other, uh, you know, learning from the other side uh, what works and what doesn't and why, and uh, how can we make the security posture, or sec how can we achieve security more efficiently? Um, and that's, uh, you know, overall trending uh, within the cloud base. So that was a long-winded answer to your question, but uh, yeah, no, I like it. I like it. And I, I mean, I'm, what what we're seeing, you know, on the on the Crosslake side is it's almost like cloud and prem. It used to be this binary choice where people would get fanatical about you know one or the other, and and now what we're seeing is the reality of our workload requires us to have a presence, you know, either still with the, you know, physical data center, what do we do with all this old hardware? Like there's still value there, or maybe there's compliance, you know, reasons, maybe there's governance reasons that you must, you know, maintain multiple footprints, you know? And so now I think more of the conversation that we're seeing, at least on the Crosslake side is how do, how do we do not either or, but both and, um, and so, you know, to the extent where we can take those learnings from both, you know, and, and kind of solve to the, not the least common denominator necessarily, but, you know, how can we standardize our tooling? How can we 
how can we not have two completely different strategies, two completely different processes, two completely different tool chains? You know, where where's that convergence? What does that look like? And you know, how do we make intelligent decisions? So that's th those are the challenges and you know the things that are coming up. You know, on on our side, definitely. definitely. And as you said, since we're not even uh, close to being fully uh, in the cloud as a, just an overall community, um, just global, uh, there's going to be use cases for both sides. And so, uh, as you said, learning how to work most efficiently on both ends is, is key. So move on to um, to what? So, moving forward. Um, there's a number of different ways you can adopt application security. Um, there's a number of different vectors, as, as you saw. Uh, now, from White Source's point of view, uh, we're focused mainly on the open source side of things. Um, so the reason being is because there's been a shift in the, in the growing DevOps space, in the digital transformation as a whole, um, from using proprietary code to using open source code. And the reason being is because it's more lightweight, it's more maneuverable. Um, when something goes wrong, it's easier to so simply plug and play a component or update a version rather than go back to your uh, legacy architecture and fix it ground up. Um, <clears throat> as, as you can imagine, it just saves a ton of time. But also on the, uh, on the architecture front, there's many more options uh, for you to be able to configure an application um, or take things from the community uh, and use those within your own code base. Uh, with that as well comes, as you can imagine, a variety of, of potential vulnerability vectors. So what we believe the three main areas to secure it against um, are first and foremost containers. So within open or closed source, containerization has become key and pivotal um, for not for basically standing up a uh, environment uh, at runtime that's not on your host operating system. Um, so with that as well comes security uh, vulnerability potential, um, API endpoints. So uh, how do you communicate most effectively between your applications to your say your database um, uh, API? So that, that's the quickest and most uh, you know true and sure way of uh, transferring information. Um, so it's definitely a major attack vector in terms of AppSec. And then as I mentioned, software composition, composition analysis, which basically equates to open source, um, open source software usage is, is key because that's where the market's shifting. And um, that's where we're seeing the majority, if you look at the, uh, the today's day and age, the um, even the hacks that happened this year, they all occurred through uh, open source vectors. So um, SCA is definitely pivotal in this day and age. So just going through the, um, the key points I touched on just now. So as uh, just to hit back on containerization. Um, so white source actually secures your entire container process or your container SDLC, if you will. So we only we not only scan and secure at the image level, but also at the container level. So we can scan at runtime and we can snapshot your application uh, as it stands, um, as well as the images that you're using to build them. So uh, we definitely encourage you to only use images from trusted sources. Um, as there's a lot of things floating around out there these days. Um, <clears throat> So when you're on your, your repositories, your GitHub, uh, another tool that White Source has that, uh, that helps this is what we call merge confidence. Uh, so we can actually uh, pinpoint through the GitHub community uh, if a version is, or if an image, say, has been, um, has been well received by, by the community, if it's been updated, uh, if it still holds vulnerabilities. Um, <clears throat> so keeping, keeping your uh, images and your code base from trusted sources is definitely important as well as keeping your containers lightweight, of course, and um, never running from your root, as, as you can imagine, which would cause uh, a lot of potential issues. Um, going into one of the bigger breaches of this year, SolarWinds, um, just to give an example, uh, something that we did a lot of research on. So SolarWinds um, was hacked through an API, uh, open source API endpoint, uh, where a backdoor was installed, left dormant for uh, X amount of, I forget how many years, uh, and then was exploited and brought down an entire um, supply chain vector. So things like this are incredibly um, important to, to be proactive with, secure against, um, especially in this case, um, your API endpoints. So 
having the correct level of authentication, having your correct uh, level of token, um, <clears throat> uh, basically a systematic way to, uh, to, to dish out your tokens so that they're not exploitable, um, so that your keys are not um, surpassable by a, potential, um, by a potential threat, by a potential hacker, like what happened with SolarWinds. Um, so setting rate limits, um, things like focusing on your identity providers, your identity uh, as in the API solution as a whole, um, come in handy very, uh, very predominantly. And I mean, this is this is admittedly this is not easy to do, right? I mean, this the slide looks great and it looks simple, like oh, just do these four things and then you're you're perfect. But you know, again, twenty years writing software and yes, we've always had to deal with this. So I'm not claiming that there's some new problem out there, but I'm just simply recognizing the fact that, you know, many software developers come up and they're, they're trained to write code and they're worried about memory management and, you know, the threats of a program that doesn't work are not always external, <laughs> you know? And so this, this really, you know, with the decomposition of applications and how, you know, everything is going to layers, it, it's, you have to repeat this process at every single layer. So your API layer has got to be secure, just like your, your view layer, you know, can't be exploitable by browser hacks and things like that, just, right? So it's like at every single layer, you've got to apply this, this rigor here. Um, and that's really the whole DevOps, DevSecOps, I, I would say, conversation here is by shifting things left, we can take the expertise of those on the on the ops side, on the compliance side, on the security side, and instead of requiring our developers to become security experts, we can inform their practice, right? By bringing things to the left and saying, look, as a developer, you can use these set of packages, you have this tooling right here, so it gives me as a developer the protection to keep doing my thing, you know, knowing that there's, it's almost like these guardrails, you know, are, are in place. And as you're driving through the windy mountain road, you know, obviously the best drivers don't need the guardrails because they're not going to drive off the side of the cliff. But yet it's nice to have the guardrail there um, because it gives me that, you know, that protection. You know, and, and now what we've got is in addition to the guardrail, we've got the early warning detection, right? So on my pull request, you know, when it runs through the scanner, I get beep, beep, you know, like, hey, this is, you know, this is maybe not an image that, you know, we want to include. Or in the API example, you know, how do I test against that? How do I run that kind of penetration test, you know, scanning against my endpoints to make sure that there's something that's not going to be exploited five years from now? Definitely. Definitely. And uh, lastly, on the topic of APIs and endpoints, um, you mentioned on your repository check, uh, we, we can actually secure not only uh, within your repository, but within your CI CD pipeline, within your browser, within your IDE, and um, and not only just a typical um, flat SHA scan, uh, which we also provide, but we can also analyze your endpoint, something we call white source prioritize, which will actually take a gauge on if you're calling the vulnerable method in said library uh, holding said CVE. Um, so we can actually see if you're exploitable or not right from your pipeline, um, right from that endpoint from where, from where you're calling. So there is just a, uh, a plethora of, of information that we're trying to secure against and you know shifting left and um, making the developer's life easier is really at the forefront of what we're trying to do. It's not, not the opposite. Um, another thing you mentioned is you know, having that information, uh, that expertise available to you at your fingertips as a developer. So um, in the way of efficiency, you know, they'll be able to see, oh, hey, I should prioritize these vulnerabilities. They're exploitable. Um, from this, from where I'm calling them, uh, but also, hey, if I need any help or if I have any questions, you have a, a team of, of resources on your behalf. So I sort of, I went through a little bit of this, but um, why we need SCA is because uh, SCA is where uh, typically is, is where the market's going. So SCA is where we've seen the largest adoption rate in terms of um, uh, just software development tools in general, open um, libraries, uh, components through your uh, your typical SCMs that we support, GitHub, GitLab, Bitbucket, <clears throat> et cetera. 
So we need to secure um, in many places in the SDLC, basically everywhere that utilizes open source within your code base. So from picking a component on your Stack Overflow all the way until it hits production um, uh, post pipeline. So we, we hit all of those areas and we try to give you an accurate gauge of Hey, are you secure? Is this, are you going to push vulnerable code into production? Or no, this is safe to push into production. Yeah, and you know, when you and I were chatting earlier, you were telling me a little bit more about the Stack Overflow, you know, integration there. And I, I wasn't even aware of that. That's, again, getting it at the research point, right? So as a developer, say I'm gonna spend X number of hours, you know, delivering on this solution, well, X divided by a very large, you know, chunk is probably gonna be me spent at the research phase. So maybe unpack that just a tiny bit more, like how does that help me? Because if I can zero in on the right solutions, you know, that it, it, it's, it's efficient, right? Cuts down some of my time. Definitely, definitely. definitely. So um, not only do we have native support to your development environments, that being your VS Code, Visual Studio, Eclipse, IntelliJ, et cetera, um, but we actually support uh, Chrome and Microsoft Edge extensions that run a lightweight HTML scan over your, uh, right in your browser as an extension. So as you are a developer looking for um, a new component to pull it into your local code, code base, um, whether you're on Stack Overflow, NPM, Maven Central, Maven repo, um, you can run that scan and it'll actually correlate to the governance that you've set up within your white source UI uh, and tell you not only is does this component have vulnerabilities just with the once over scan, but are you violating any policies within your organization as well? Yeah, that's, that's super powerful. Th those, those kinds of things excite me because when you can bring a few things together and streamline someone's workflow, it's it's, it's creating that efficiency. It's eliminating a little bit of noise. Anytime we can eliminate just, just a tiny bit of noise, that's a, that's a win. Multiply that times every developer, times every team, right? So it just keeps on going. Yes, it does. And that is what we aim for. So when we look when we dive a little bit deeper into software composition analysis and what white source um, deems as uh, let's call them the four primary pillars of how to secure your open source landscape. Um, the first one on your top left, the inventory management. So, uh, so that's the detection piece. So getting all of your open source components in an inventory style format, um, just laid out so you can see your open source usage as a whole. Um, you know, if you can, you can see alerts such as are there multiple licenses assigned to some library? Are there, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, are there any licensing policy violation alerts, any vulnerability policy violation alerts, just as a whole, um, just to get a posture going. So then uh, vulnerability detection. Uh, so not only are we detecting just your pure open source inventory, but also any of the vulnerabilities that go along with it, that being from the security standpoint, your, your typical CVE, CVSS. White Source also partners with a variety of um, private security advisories globally. So we actually curate uh, in our database um, what we call white source vulnerabilities. And these are uh, vulnerabilities published within advisories that have been confirmed you know, within the community, but maybe have been queued up for um, publishing publication on the NVD. So we'll still alert you to those as well, even if they haven't been quote unquote published, uh, as well as the full NVD. So having the detection piece done, um, we look at, and along with the detection uh, as well, I should mention, is the open source uh, license compliance piece. So um, we're one of the only companies that focuses holistically on both sides of the spectrum, uh, the security uh, and the licensing side. Um, so we'll give you any of your licensing risk as well as licensing detail along with your, um, with your library detail there. Which brings us to the final pillar of remediation prioritization, as I spoke to before, the ability to have uh, that exploitability metric at your disposal. So you can not only see, does this library hold X number of vulnerabilities, but are you actually calling them? Are you exploitable? Uh, so having that is extremely powerful. Uh, we've been able to help decrease the SLA times in many, many development teams. Um, and uh, yeah, it, it's just invaluable. So 
bring it back a step um, <clears throat> and getting into more of the integration piece. So typically there's been two types of SCA solutions in the space that we've seen, um, of course, prior to white source. And those are the ones that are focused on governance and then the ones that are focused on integrating with uh, developer tools specifically. So white source combines that and we're focused uh, not only on developer tool integration, which we offer a plethora of, I should mention, uh, not only, again, not only within your uh, IDEs and repositories, but we plug into every ma major CI tool. Um, we plug into our factory. Uh, we, we, can, we have the ability to plug into JIRA and MS work items, create tickets uh, to your workflow. So point being is that we have a ton to offer around governance and governance is become a, uh, a seemingly more important piece um, as we as we look at the, the growth of the AppSec landscape and the customers that we work with, just being able to mold um, the white source environment to spec uh, to mirror your own uh, internal organization environment rules, um, what's allowed, what's not allowed. So having that has been uh, extremely powerful, um, coupled with the uh, plethora of vulnerability information that you get from, from the tool in general. And now um, to hit cleanly on the shift left piece, uh, uh, I'll, I'll bring it up maybe one more time, <laughs> but um, we just to, just to lay it out so you guys can see, um, we really put emphasis on plugging in to as many pieces of the um, software development lifecycle as possible and as far left as possible. So as far left, again, as the IDE, so we have a browser that sits and runs um, in the background while you're developing your code, alerting you to any CVEs, any licensing defects. Um, not only that, prior to pulling code into your IDE, we have the browser tool that will actually monitor uh, what you're looking at pulling in. So you're not pulling in anything defective at the forefront. Um, then once we, we get into our repository integration, so we get past the IDE, we have a repository check that can actually automate uh, fixed pull requests for you upon configuring correctly. It uh, can also show you the merge confidence of, uh, of possible, up, uh, license, excuse me, possible library upgrades um, to new versions. Again, can be automated with the correct configuration. Um, and then finally onto the CI CD. So just having that final check, having the endpoint check as well, like, uh, right within your pipeline um, is extremely powerful. So again, we're not pushing things um, with vulnerabilities uh, if possible into production. And then, and then lastly, lastly, I'm sorry. Um, lastly, on the containerization end of things, being able to fully support your containerized application base. So within all of these integrations, fully supporting um, a containerized environment. Yeah, I think a lot of times when we see um, we see that diagram uh, now, it's almost like the the message here is that security is what's flowing all the way around, right? So that that's the integration piece. So. Not only are DevOps no longer siloed, but they're knit together with this kind of security compliance governance, you know, type conversation. Um, so I, I like all of this stuff. You know, the more we can visualize things, you know, it's easier to solve a problem when you can visualize the problem. So to, to that same extent, the more we can visualize these intersections and, you know, where we can optimize different parts of the, of the overall pipeline is huge, hugely helpful. And that's what we're ultimately looking to do is get a, um, <clears throat> a full posture on your open source security within your open source SDLC. So being able to quickly pinpoint um, how are we doing at the repository level uh, for set application? How are we doing at the CI CD level? Uh, how are we doing at the, you know, at the developer level at the IDE, uh, at the IDE level and having quick checks and balances there is also um, a big driver for us. So to bring it full circle um, in terms of SCA security, um, open source security, we're first and foremost looking at, um, at prioritization. So prioritization does encompass um, detection as well. So detection is key, a uh, key part of what we do at the core. Um, so we lay the layer of prioritization that we, uh, that we place emphasis on these components that we scan, uh, we put at the forefront um, because that's really what's not only going to fix 
your vulnerabilities, but it's going to not overwhelm your developers with a million CVEs to fix, and it's going to give you a better security posture fixing what's exploitable first. Uh, having that level of automation next, so the ability to have automatic remediation pull requests um, configured, the ability to have automatic versioning updates configured, uh, the ability to have automated scans running in the background of your browser and your IDE, um, as well as things like the ability to fail builds in your pipeline um, is something that we support greatly. Uh, so basically any checks and balances to, to really not to automate, but also to, to have as many to have as much of a posture when we get to that production phase as possible. And then purely to be able to scale on, on this. So to be able to have uh, your entire enterprise secure, not just one application. Um, so having that congruity between the DevSecOps teams, right, between your security, your development teams, uh, to, to have a, a fully flushed out workflow and something viewable by, uh, by everybody, having everybody working for it. Yeah, and then a lot of the a lot of the work that you know I'm involved with at, at Crosslake that that one word scalability you know that's key and and we want to understand how can not only an application scale to handle you know more load but how can the team scale to maybe build more into the application how can the pipeline scale to support more releases how can the tool chain, you know, scale to support more code scans. And so it's almost like everything is about, you know, scalability, scalability, scalability at each of those levels. You know, it's, we, we're, as technologists, we're comfortable decomposing our application into, you know, presentation layer, and persistence layer, et cetera. But you, you almost zoom out and you're seeing your teams, you know, how do you kind of piece together teams and, you know, have security as this thread that's woven all the way through so that you can still, you know, swap things around, move people around, dynamically adjust your organization, just like your software is dynamically adjusting in some cases, you know, the flow of data. So very, very interesting, you know, very interesting uh, problems that we're solving these days. But that one theme of scalability. Um, so, so the opposite of that would be that noise or that bottleneck. Right. So as we are designing for scalability in mind, we're essentially designing against or targeting, you know, the removal of those little hiccups, the things that slow us down, the things that trip us up. Definitely. <clears throat> the removal of bottlenecks has, has been a huge focus of what we're trying to do overall. So it's, it's a good way to put it. So uh, to wrap up my piece here today, um, so with white source and just your uh, typical SCA solutions, um, white source specifically, we're going to offer you the you know, top of the line remediation advice, and that is down to the endpoint of um, of where you're calling with your source code uh, a vulnerable method. Um, we also do a lot around API security, so uh, we know that's a huge attack vector. We do a lot of authentication. Um, we're not specifically an endpoint security company, but we uh, we definitely place a lot of emphasis on encryption and uh, methods such as that. Again, congruity with DevSecOps is huge, um, as we've been talking about today. Uh, just having that that uh, the ease of use be truly ease of use uh, across all teams um, is something that we shoot for. So making not only the developers' lives easier, but also your DevOps manager, your security uh, your security manager, your legal folks, um, having them all be on the same page, uh, working towards something uh, whole is something that we strive for. And then um, <clears throat> protecting and, and uh, against code that's going to be, become uh, or security is code that become more, more common in protecting applications throughout the SDLC. Um, so, so white source, we're constantly evolving. Uh, so with the, um, we're constantly scaling as well, just to take a, a theme from the last slide. So we're constantly evolving our coding languages, uh, looking for new places to plug in, new integrations. Um, we're updating our advisories, our database um, upwards of, uh, 10 plus times a day, uh, we're, we're looking for those new vulnerabilities. We're looking for those um, <clears throat> those white source vulnerabilities being published to the NVD. So, and we'll alert you to all of that. So um, really having 
the congruity between your security tech, um, expertise and your end user and your organization is also another, I guess, uh, I'll, I'll ending. I'll end with that. Um, giving the customer as much information at their fingertips as possible is what, uh, is what we strive to do. Well, so I think as we're kind of landing the plane here on, on the, the content, I, I did think it's helpful for us to kind of zoom out just one more time and, and maybe try to orient some of the, our conversation here across this, you know, people, process, and tools and technology, you know, sort of landscape. And, you know, one of the earlier slides, um, uh, you had that graphic where you're talking about sort of the, the demand versus the supply and recognizing that, you know, we, we, we do have more um, technical folks these days who are working in the security space. That's great. So we, you know, we're starting to solve, you know, some of that, but there's still this huge demand, um, you know, for security. And so anytime you have a high demand and a low supply, there it is. There's the, there's the bottleneck there. So that's not necessarily an actionable item, but simply a recognition of where we are today. Um, it's, it, and not just security professionals, but, you know, it, it's a tough labor market right now. It's very difficult to, you know, find people and then to retain them. Um, so we're, we're certainly certainly aware of that. Um, I, I don't think we touched on this earlier, but um, kind of a helpful talking point. I think when you're when you're thinking through how do I solve some of these, you know, transformative, you know, processes is understanding the difference between creators and maintainers. And what do I mean by that? I mean, sometimes you're going to bring in um, a highly skilled, you know, individual who's who's maybe very narrowly focused, um, you know, bordering on my, myopia um, to come in here and massively move the needle for you to create something out of nothing. Um, those people um, are generally very bored if you ask them to maintain a system or a problem that's already been solved. So maintainers, on the other hand, are the people who are 100% comfortable taking something that exists and figuring out how to innovate on that, making it better and better and better. And they can go the distance over quarters, months, you know, years, et cetera, um, in your organization. So super key. I, I, I just like to leave this, you know, message as often as I'm, you know, given the microphone is that make sure you know what, what problem you're solving here. Are you creating something out, you know, ex nihilo? Do you, do you have a huge gap that you need to fill? Maybe don't worry about, finding the person who's going to be with your team for, you know, five or eight or 12 years, maybe find the person who's going to be with your team for 12 to 18 months who can massively move the needle and then come in and bring in the person who can build on that work. Um, so again, anyway, it's, it's, it's all about, you know, putting the right people in the right seats and understanding where you are on the journey, you know, right now. So that, that's kind of a, you know, Brian, I don't know if any, if you're, if you're seeing kind of the same thing, that might be just Eric's little soapbox there on creators and maintainers. Oh, I definitely agree. Um, you know, having the correct personnel in there that's going to, you know, make the most impact, but also uh, you know, drive the most efficiency within the topics that we talked about today is going to be, it's going to be key just for that overall transparency and bridging those gaps. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so uh, over here on process, I mean, we've, we've talked about shift left. It is kind of a buzzy word, but it's a very powerful concept um, to the extent that you can move the things that are known further left in the creation process. You can influence the quality of the product on, on, the, on the production end and indirectly amplify, you know, the velocity. So that's, that's really the whole, that's the magic of shift left. You know, if you knew you were going to stop it and fail the release all the way at the end because a wrong package was selected. Let's just select the right package in the beginning, you know? And so really that, while it seems simple, it's really about conversation. You want, you know, your security folks to talk to your developers. You want your developers to be able to go to the security folks and say, Hey, this is a great new package. Can I use it? And the security folks say, you know, <laughs> that one is actually on the top 10, you know, violating the OWASP or, you know, or whatever it is. And so that conversation can help solve for, you know, the right package, get that decided sooner and then makes everyone, you know, everyone's life easier on the other side. Um, the second bullet under here really has to do with standards patterns. Um, and so once defined, once you know what a good package is, how do you bake not just that one security package, but how do you bake the full variety of packages 
into almost this reusable pattern or template um, standards, et cetera. So here's how this works. If I, as a developer, am asked to work on, say, I need to spin up a new microservice. Well, if and, and I'm using Python because that just happens to be my language. Well, if the security and compliance team have already agreed and they have blessed you know, this library of packages and they've already suggested which logging framework I'm gonna use it. And so to the extent that the, the confusing parts of what do I use um, are sorted, I can just get to work writing code. I mean, that's amazing. That's great for me as a developer um, because you know, I may not be an expert in all these areas. So again, let me work out of my strength, let the security team work out of their strength and let's all work together. Um, and, and honestly, that just ties everything together down here at the bottom. Again, standards and patterns, you'll see that repeated. You know, this opinionated tool chain, the automation using products, you know, like white source, embedding them into your CI, CD, ultimately is gonna drive you towards, you know, dashboards, visibility, and that last bullet here, and I'll, I'll kind of close with this, but actionable data. Um, and so last soapbox moment for me is, is there's so much data flying around and you can make beautiful dashboards that show all kinds of cool stuff. And, you know, when I put on my CTO hat, I'm, you know, first I'm like, well, that's great. I love that. That looks pretty. Um, what does it mean? What does it tell me? And what can I do with that data? So again, measure what's normal, figure out when you're deviating from normal and alert, you know, or monitor to that effect. So that's one part of dashboards. And then the other part is, is the, the Kaizen effect. How do we, looking back at the last 13 weeks, what is our trend? Is it going in the direction that we want it to go? If so, great, let's pat ourselves on the back. Then let's ask the question, what are we doing? How can we do more of that? Have we hit the point where, you know, we've, we've squeezed out the maximum amount of juice here and we've got the optimization or is there more, you know, is there more, you know, that we, that we can get out of that. The only way you're going to be able to answer those questions is when you have the right data and it's visible. Um, but the, the caution here is don't have so much data that you don't know what you're doing with it. That, and that's, that's a huge, that's a huge um, temptation, right? Is to have all the data and then be overwhelmed by it. So I'll, I'll leave it with that. Um, Brian, unless you have anything to add, I, I think Charlene's got a couple um, questions queued up for us. Um, and so happy to, happy to take those. Sure. Uh, I'm all set. We can go ahead and take questions. All right. Great. So yes, we have gotten a couple questions in so far, but there is time, guys. If you have a question for Eric or for Brian, go ahead and use the question and answer tab, or you can use the chat tab and we'll move it over for you. We've gotten some good questions in so far. Let's go ahead and dive into the ones we've gotten. Let's see. Uh, Lon asks, where in the DevSecOps pipeline are the white source tools best deployed and used? Uh, would it be Git, Code, Pull, Commit, SAS, DAST? What do you guys think? Um, so, if the first part of the question is where is the white source tools best fit in the pipe in the STLC? Mm -hmm. So, um, really, uh, they they fit in everywhere. I, I mean, that's I try not to use that answer, but um, definitely in your in your Git repository. So, with every commit, we can have an automated um, scan run. So anything that basically that commits or changes an object um, to any of the open source files will trigger a scan, um, which can also be configured to automate pull requests. I know there was a question about, about that. So we do have the ability to have those automated pull requests created for you. Um, and then all you'd have to do is simply merge in the fix. Uh, however, that's not the only place that you should be looking uh, to plug in a tool like white source. I would say the other places uh, would be your IDE in your browser, as well as your CI CD pipeline, so that you'll have, um, you know, past your your Git, your SCM, you'll have uh, you'll have additional checks and balances on um, on if and where you're pulling in any vulnerable code base. Yeah, I just kind of I switched back to the the slide. I thought you know you you've actually got mm -hmm. some call outs here, you know, specifically to to so maybe this is the visual answer mm -hmm. um, to the to the audio talk track there. Uh, I don't know if there's a follow-up, but but if there was, Lon, again, feel free to um, you know throw it in the chat. Happy to happy to reconnect. Yeah. Okay. 
Great. So next question, uh, Athira asks, uh, what are best practices can we follow when considering uh, the security of services in general? So um, best practices that I can re recommend for services in general or, or microservices is to take a proactive approach, um, that being on the governance side, but also on the scanning side. So uh, not, not to overlap, um, but having, having your governance set up for a microservice uh, structure, first and foremost, if I was to work with a, a customer, uh, working in a microservice fa uh, fashion, I would have everything all set up, have all your teams, have everything organized, uh, all your policies in place, basically have your system of governance to what you're going to alert your end user, that end user being your developer, your security person. Um, so have it routed to the correct microservice and have the correct checks and balances in place, uh, aside from having those tools uh, baked into your SDLC at, um, at various integration points, as I mentioned, being your repository or your CI/CD pipeline. And and just to just to kind of tag on to that, you know, again, it's a conversation. So to the extent that in your agile planning process, um, your security and governance, you know, team members, whether it's the stakeholder or the actual, you know, individuals on your team who are going to be doing some of the work, to the extent that you can bring everybody together during that planning phase. Again, same same thing. Shift all of that left. You know, we we want to have the big epic, so we want to have the big idea. So maybe that's where you know certain key things come into play. And then when we get into story writing and we start breaking the work down, you know, from the epic. Again, make sure you've got the right people, you know, at the table. Um, again, conversation. Everything is conversation. Excellent. All right, great. So Lon just sent in a big thank you for for your answer. He said slide 17 is very helpful. That's what I was looking to see. So there you go. Thanks. Thanks, Lon, for sending that in. Uh, OK, great. So uh, we uh, still have plenty of time for questions. We still have a couple more questions in here. But uh, please, uh, if you have a, do have a question, please feel free to send it on in. And we'll get to as many as we can. OK, here is a question from uh, Devaraj, um, who actually would like to know more about the auto remediation in SCA, software composition analysis. Um, sure. So, so the S, so the auto remediation function that we offer, uh, it sits directly within your repository. So it's, it's centric to the repository or SCM native integrations that we offer. And um, basically what will happen is upon configuration, you can uh, dictate um, how you want these pull requests to be automated. You can also set uh, what we call integration workflow rules, which are basically policies centric to the auto remediation pull requests. You can actually configure them in a policy fashion um, to basically create these PRs where and when you want them. Um, so then again, back to the point that uh, when white source for say GitHub is configured, every commit that you, you'll be running is going to trigger a, um, a white source scan in the background, uh, if you deem. And then with those scan results, the auto PRs will be generated from your workflow rules. Uh, that, that's, a ba that's a basic once over on how it works. Um, again, more than happy to follow up offline if anyone wants additional info or a, a demonstration. Excellent. All right. Let's see. Okay. Next question here. Um, oh, here's oh, here's a good one. So you spoke about DevSecOps and the developer role. How do you see the security team role in this approach? Uh, I'll I'll start, and then maybe Brian, you add on and perhaps give the more complete answer. Um, but I, I think. We haven't been able to say this yet, so I just wanted to make sure I could get this in because it is an IT webinar. The answer to the question is, it depends. There we go. So <laughs> we, we, have, we, we have to, we've got to have at least that, you know, out there at least once, but <laughs> right. what does it depend on? So obviously it's going to depend on the size of your team. Um, and so if, if your team is like a lot of the teams I work with, smaller teams, uh, not on the enterprise side, then you might have shared hats. There might be someone, there might be one of your developers who 
really likes the security stuff. And so that's kind of your security person, although maybe not, you know, you don't have a CISO or anything formalized. So for that, you know, that small of a team, obviously the answer is going to be very, very different, <laughs> you know, to the question than um, if you are working on, you know, a large multinational organization that's got, you know, hundreds, if not thousands and thousands, you know, of, of team members. So I think the the first the first thing to understand is kind of calibrate that to your, you know, your area, your um, experience. So your team's maturity and also the size. Um, and, and so I guess one more little caveat here is we, we're always um, inundated with best practice and what someone else's team is doing. And I, I want to make sure that, you know, when you read about those best practices, you put those in context as well. So what has their team been able to do so that they can make the argument that this is the best practice? Fantastic. Now, then the question becomes, what can we, our team, in our context, learn from that team's best practice so that we can make an effective practice for our team? So take everything, you know, again, this is what's behind the it depends. Take everything that you read, everything that you hear out there, you know, and, and including what, you know, Brian and I say, and make sure you calibrate that, you know, for your own context. And so with that disclaimer now, ladies and gentlemen, here is the real answer to the question that was just asked. Brian. <laughs> no, I, th I think that was a uh, very, uh, very well thought out answer. Uh, definitely a great example of, of, um, <clears throat> of a scenario that I would like to, that I would typically see. Um, and then I'll just bring it back to the point that you made on that slide 17, where it's sort of security going in full circle in that figure eight. Um, so you know, I'll give another high level, which is not that uh, it depends, but, uh, we're trying to have the security role not be a detriment. So in the past, security is seen as, not in the past, I mean, even so, even currently, it's seen as maybe a, you know, an additional work item as from a developer. So, so really, security is sort of um, not the all-encompassing glue that holds these, these teams together, but it, it plays a key role. Uh, so you as a security manager are uh, overseeing the structure, the... Um, uh, the governance from the security standpoint that's uh, actually seen within the platform that trickles down, uh, making sure uh, that uh, having all reports viewable, making sure that basically people are staying on track, but also communicating with legal folks on, on the legal side because you're going to have a security posture there as well. Uh, not making, again, not making more, works, more work for your developers, having all of the integrations in place uh, communicating with people um, like myself on the on the actual security end of things and uh, making sure you have um, prioritization in place correctly, making sure that you have your posture uh, set in all those areas and working correctly. So so the security role is is key as I see it, um, as we see it here at White Source, uh, definitely multifaceted and um, and yeah, hopefully that answers that question. All right. Great. Well, we are about three minutes to the top of the hour. So unfortunately, that is all the time that we have for the question and answer period. I do want to thank everybody who did submit questions. There were some really good ones. And if we didn't get to your question, I know we have one or two in there that we didn't get to. I apologize. Uh, but please know that the folks at White Source are getting a copy of all the questions that came in. And I'm sure they'll be more than happy to follow up with you offline to get your question answered. Uh, also, a quick reminder that today's event has been recorded. So if you missed any or all of the event, or if you just want to watch it again, you'll have the opportunity to do so. Following today's webinar, we will be sending out an email that contains a link to access the webinar on demand. And the webinar is also going to be living on the Security Boulevard website. So you can go look for it there. Just go to securityboulevard.com slash webinars and look in the on-demand section. Should be right there waiting for you. Okay, before we close things out, did want to do that drawing for the four twenty-five dollar Amazon gift cards. So, without further ado, uh, let's let's do it. Our first winner today is Lon M. Congratulations, Lon. Second winner today is uh, Gianpaolo M. Congratulations, Gianpaolo. Our third winner today is. Michael Y, congratulations, Michael. And our fourth and final winner today is K 
Katerina H. Congratulations, Katerina. We'll be following up with all four of you offline by email to get your Amazon gift card over to you. So please check your inbox. And if you don't see anything there, please check your spam folder. Uh, Eric and Brian, thank you guys so much for a great presentation. Lots and lots of good information there. And uh, judging from the caliber of the questions that came in, I'm sure I know the audience got a lot out of it as well. So thank you guys. I appreciate your time and your expertise. Thank you. All right. Also want to thank the audience for joining me today. This is Charlene O'Hanlon and I am signing off. Have a great day, everybody, and please stay safe.